that was the worst day of my life. Like through all of this, my entire life, that was the worst day because I was already at this horrible low. And then I went there and I'm like, okay, I like my boyfriend, my mom, they all knew what, what I was going for is for this diagnosis. And I had to come home and tell them she said I don't have it, which just leaves me in this place of like complete invalidation, just making me fear that everyone's going to think I'm crazy. And all of it was a thousand percent real. Like it's just, and you know, and everyone who's probably watching this knows it's so scary and so real. Hey everyone, welcome back. I have Erica here with me today. Erica has been on her own journey with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME-CFS and has made incredible, incredible progress on that recovery journey. So I'm just always so excited to share stories like this. So thank you, Erica, for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here and get my story out there. I think my story looks a little bit different from some of the ones I've seen on your channel. So yeah. All right, so let's uh, let's dive right in. Take us back. Um, you know, what okay. happened? Yeah, so I know that a lot of people on your channel have, of course, watched a lot of videos. They have this very clear before and after, you know, when they didn't have chronic fatigue and when they did. And for me, that was the case. And actually, it's quite wild. Um, I looked back at my doctor's appointments and at like my Instagram stories from last year this time, and it is today is the one year anniversary of the day I developed chronic fatigue. So I didn't plan it that way. I didn't, um, you know, when I scheduled the interview, I hadn't gone back and looked at all that, but I'm just kind of like, okay, that's weird that wow. it's been exactly a year to the day. But um, my story starts way before that. For a lot of people, a lot of people's stories I've seen, they, you know, maybe they had a stressful life, but they weren't necessarily consciously aware that they were struggling. Um, maybe they were just, you know, training really hard for something or they were, really busy at work or something like that. And then boom, they get a virus, chronic fatigue. For me, I was very consciously struggling, battling for like the eight months prior to developing chronic fatigue. And I can see patterns of kind of similar, I don't know, just kind of similar symptomology and stuff happening earlier in my life as well. So the reason I go back to 2016 is that was the last time in my life, like pre anything, pre any health issues, pre any you know, anxiety, mental health struggles. 2017 was really the year that I was diagnosed with anxiety and it was really debilitating when it started. It was sudden onset. Um, it was one of those things where I just, I had no clue what was happening to me. I didn't have any experience with anyone in my family dealing with it. And yeah, so that was kind of the year of learning about that kind of coming out of it, but kind of not really. 2018 was actually a really good year in my life. I started dating my boyfriend, you know, the honeymoon phase kind of blissful, everything felt good again. Um, and then 2019, I did my dietetic internship. So I'm actually a dietitian. I had already graduated with a degree in dietetics, but I had started my dietetic internship and that was a really, really stressful time in my life. Not only did I have to move away from my parents, my family, my boyfriend, and it wasn't that far. It was only like two hours, but I wasn't used to that. Um, but on top of that, you're paying thousands of dollars, like 10 grand for the six month program and you're paying to live and you're being critiqued and learning new things every day. And just, it's really stressful. So that was kind of the first time in my life where I started to notice this pattern of, at that time, it was a lot of pain, like a lot of chronic neck and back pain. And I would feel it a lot during the week when I was stressed out. And then I'd come home on the weekends and I would notice myself feeling a lot better. Like I would be engaged with people and doing things I enjoyed. And at that time, I would feel like the pain would kind of go away. So kind of my first recognition of that sort of pattern. Anyways, the real story starts early February, I would say 2021. Uh, we had just gotten back from a vacation. It was with my boyfriend's whole extended family. And it was a great vacation. But I got home and I started to just feel like a lot of those old anxious feelings from 2017 when that first initial debilitating onset of anxiety happened. Similar thought patterns, just kind of like, why am I so anxious? Am I going to get depressed? You know, people who get depressed often have suicidal thoughts. And I had trauma in that area from people close to me. And so I'm just like, ah! and, you know, I go down this, this thought spiral and I found myself in this super like. I couldn't eat. I, you know, I was functioning to the point where it's not like I was allowing myself to miss work because that kind of goes along with the thought patterns of, well, you know, if I get really depressed, then I'll stop doing things and then life won't be worth it. And like, just 
that's kind of the thought process that I would go down. And so the thought of missing work, even though I felt so horrible, just kind of confirmed like, oh, I'm going down that road. So I would make myself go. But like, again, I couldn't eat. I would um, when I would eat, it would just sit in my stomach like a literal brick. And um, I was having so much reflux. But I ended up seeing a GI doctor and he kind of made me go through the gamut of, you know, first we're going to try you on an antacid. I'm like, I've already tried that. So I did end up going on it, though, because I wanted to like kind of do his protocol to ultimately get what I wanted, which I wanted to get tested for SIBO. And this is actually a big thing. I have a feeling a lot of the people that are listening to this probably have very similar gut related issues. And I do feel like I have a lot of insights on those gut issues, especially being a dietitian and going through it myself. So that's kind of why I tell this extensive background story, because I do think I can be helpful in that, in that way. But yeah, so for people, sorry, just before we go on for people who aren't familiar with SIBO, can you explain what that is? Yeah. So SIBO stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And essentially, I guess the way to describe it is if you think of what's going on in your colon, that's normal. You know, you have millions, billions of bacteria that are uh, populating in that area. Any food that goes undigested, which is like all the fibers we eat and everything, the bacteria's job is to kind of break that down and they produce gases as a byproduct. And so, you know, when you have gas, like we all do, I'm a dietitian, I'm very comfortable uh, talking about (laughs) bowel related things, but um, (laughs) that's normal. That's a normal process. But what happens is when you're migrating motor complex or just think of it as like the muscular contractions of your entire GI tract, when those slow down, food is sitting in the upper GI tract for a long period of time, not just the lower, because really your small intestine is supposed to move very quickly. You know, you pass the food through, it gets absorbed and the colon is where it sits there for like a a way longer period of time and the bacteria work on it. But when none of it is moving quickly for whatever reason, in my case, probably severe anxiety and some people, maybe they have abdominal adhesions um, and some people, maybe they have celiac disease and their gut just is compromised for whatever reason, it's moving slowly, that food sits in that upper small intestine for a lot longer of a period of time. And those bacteria can migrate upwards and start to populate in the small intestine. So it's it's a bacterial overgrowth of the small intestine. And you can imagine if, um, you know, you think about when you have a lot of gas in general, the colon is a very, very short section of bowel the small intestine is like six times as long. So if you have gas in six times the amount of space that you normally would, you can imagine how bloated you are, how uncomfortable you are, how much distension, how much, and that intra-abdominal pressure is pressing up and causing this reflux. So um, that's really kind of the deal with SIBO. So how did this all tie in um, with your journey or, or what happened from there? Yeah. So eventually, and now we're at um, summer 2021, like let's say probably beginning of September, I finally get tested for SIBO after getting an upper endoscopy and doing the whole thing. Um, And this whole time I am just researching like avidly and like uh, probably 80% of my day is spent trying to fix myself from all of these issues. So I get tested for SIBO. I come out positive. And in order to be positive, you have to have 20 parts per million of whatever gas they're measuring in your breath. Mine was 120, which is kind of like unheard of high, like just really, really severe. Um, And I was prepared. I know that when you have SIBO, you either go on a herbal antimicrobial treatment, which you have to basically self-administer unless you're working with a naturopath, or a doctor will prescribe you Zyfaxin, which is the gold standard antibiotic. It's a localized antibiotic, so it's pretty safe. Um, but I was reading a lot about it and I don't know, you, you get on those rabbit holes of the internet and people are like, you know, it, I, I started taking it and my dad died. Like just the most <laughs> dramatic things that are unrelated, but probably just ended up happening. So I'm scaring myself to death about taking this, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't have a choice. I'm miserable. So I end up taking the antibiotic and it actually was about two days into taking it September 16th that the fatigue onset. Um, and I actually, I had had the stomach flu about a month, three weeks prior. And so I think a lot of people might think that that was the onset. I think that was just another part of the snowball. Um, I had just got done being sick. I didn't really develop fatigue after that, but then I start this antibiotic and it's pretty aggressive. Like you have all this bacteria, they're all dying off. And when they're dying off, they're releasing these 
these toxins, if you will, I don't really love the word toxins, but they're having this reaction to dying. And for some people, it can cause like flu-like symptoms. It can cause, it basically can make you feel like you're ill. So when I'm, so here I am eight months into feeling super horrible, really bad mental health, really bad physical health, trying to fix myself so hypervigilant. I get sick um, with a stomach virus and then I start an antibiotic and my body's like, you're done, we're done. <laughs> like fatigue onset. So the best way I can describe the fatigue, and this is what I like really have wanted people to say, and maybe they have, and I've just missed it. But like, I try to describe the fatigue to people. And my best way of doing it is think of like when you have the flu, there's pretty much four elements, at least for me, when I have the flu, I have a fever. I, um, I get like the hot and cold chills, which pretty much is the fever. Usually there's like an associated full body pain. And then the fourth element is just this intense fatigue. I don't know, like for me, if I try and shower when I have the flu, I like need to sit down. I can't stand and wash my hair when I have the flu. It's just too exhausting. Like getting up to go to the bathroom is exhausting. Sometimes it's even so bad you don't even want to roll over. And so that's really what started for me on that day. And it was terrifying because I'm already coming from this place of health anxiety. And now I'm you know, now things have gotten even worse. And so I just like found myself in such a hopeless place. I, I was, of course, I already was on top of it. I'm like, this is probably chronic fatigue because I had been down this rabbit hole of learning about SIBO and lots of people with SIBO have chronic fatigue. And so I just kind of was like, here, here, here it comes. (laughs) And then another big thing was shaking. I was like, just my muscles felt so weak, almost as if I had done you know, 30 jump squats. And then you try to walk downstairs, like your legs are just like shaking. Uh, my abs, my abs, similarly, if I bend over, I just feel like I need to fall over. So that was kind of my main symptoms that onset at that point. Wow. That sounds intense. And, you know, that's one of the reasons you don't like the word um, toxins. I don't like the word mild, you know, when we talk about this condition, because I feel like there is no mild version of it. Like it's all hell. Yes. It's different dimensions of hell, but yeah. uh, it's always a nightmare. I haven't talked yeah. to a single person, even if they're on the mild end, that it didn't just completely turn their life upside down and scare them to death. And yeah. then with what the doctors are you know, prescribing you or, or is not helpful, is actually making things worse. Yeah. Um, what, what do you do? Like, what, what did you do? So I did um, end up going to see a cardiologist because I guess the other part that I left out of this is I also that was the onset of like POTS for me. Um, I use the word POTS because that's basically what was happening. Did I get a diagnosis? No. And I'm actually going to go into that. But I went to see this cardiologist. And like I said, I had been researching and I'm not talking like a simple Google search. I'm talking I'm, I'm watching podcasts. I'm on like the leading experts of POTS websites, I'm, I'm just like in it. And I know what a POTS diagnosis is. It's your, your sitting heart rate to your standing heart rate jumps more than 30 or your standing heart rate is just above 120 and your blood pressure stays the same. I went in the office, I reproduced that and the girl goes, Oh no, your blood pressure stayed the same. So you don't have it. And I'm like, are like I, that was the worst day of my life like through all of this my entire life that was the worst day because I was already at this horrible low and then I went there and I'm like okay I like my boyfriend my mom they all knew what what I was going for is for this diagnosis and I had to come home and tell them she said I don't have it which just leaves me in this place of like complete invalidation just making me fear that everyone's going to think I'm crazy and all of it was a thousand percent real. Like it's just, and you know, and everyone who's probably watching this knows it's so scary and so real. Um, but yeah, I, I had 30 symptoms. I told her about that day and she sends me home and she's like, you're you're fine. You're healthy. I'm like, no, I'm not. (laughs) So I, I was like scream crying in the car on the way home. That was the worst day. So from that point forward, I never went to another doctor to try and get any validation because I guess part of what I left out is I had been to urgent care several times related to the heart stuff I was scared of. Um, I had been to my PCP probably two or three times, and this is the second time I had been to a cardiologist. So I I was just done. I don't really know exactly how long, probably a couple weeks. I kind of just sat in that still researching, still being terrified zone. And I eventually discovered the Gupta program. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to come on is um, I hadn't heard anyone's story that used the Gupta program. I originally discovered DNRS and they don't offer a money back guarantee. And I didn't really feel like I could 
get a super great feel for what I what it was going to be. And so I didn't want to like drop all the money. But with the Gupta program, you actually get to to try out like the first couple of sessions for free. And then it is a money back guarantee. So um, after you've tried it for six months and then up until a year, you can return like the program and the book and everything. And I'm like, OK, well, I'm not really out anything besides, you know, a solid down payment of like four hundred dollars. But So I got the program and that is ultimately what probably healed me the most. It's very similar to a lot of the other programs that you've had on your channel. They all kind of follow similar themes. You know, there's a meditation theme. There's a maybe try this supplement theme, um, get out in the sun. But the biggest thing is the brain retraining portion. Um, and of course, I, you know, there's no way I can actually tell people what I did. But the general idea is they actually send you this like map. You set it on the floor and you walk on it. But that's like, you don't have to continue to do it that way, but it's kind of just to like, I guess, teach it essentially. But it's sort of this combination of like talking to your parts, which, you know, we're all probably either a perfectionist or a people pleaser or some sort of personality trait that makes us susceptible to this. And so you're working with that part. And this is all like a mental exercise. You're working with that part of yourself. You're working with your worried self. You're working with your trainer self. It's a lot of just self-talk and changing narratives. And then there's also a lot of like visualization, um, trying to like truly bring yourself back to a time when you were healthy in your mind. There's even things like doing certain hand motions so that your brain starts to associate when I do this is when I'm visualizing the good thing is when I'm, you know, telling myself good thoughts. And like, essentially, the idea is if you repetitively do this in response to any symptom, any negative thought, over time, your brain just starts to change. And I will say, you know, you're supposed to do it so many times a day and you're supposed to do it every time you have a symptom. And to me, the process took like probably four or five minutes each time. And like I said, I even though I was so miserable and it was so hard, I never allowed myself to not go to work. I mean, I work an office job, so I drive to work. I sit at a desk. Yeah, I might see a patient or two. And yeah, it might be hard and I might be literally like we had to wear masks, too. And I was just so out of breath from like standing at this point because of my pot stuff. But I just I just kept going. Um, But it made it really hard to continuously do this. But the other thing that's really nice about the program is he's constantly telling you, like, don't add more stress to yourself. Don't um, try and be a perfectionist when it comes to this. Do what you can do. What's, you know, sustainable for you. So I really I really tried hard to just apply it where I could. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I definitely was like in my head being like, I'm not doing enough and everything. But I just tried really hard to to change the narrative and to just do what I could. So I would say it was probably, I don't know, two, three weeks, maybe a month into it that I really started to notice just a decrease in a lot of my symptoms. The heart rate stuff wasn't quite as bad. I would get breaks from the fatigue. Um, I still crashed so easily. There was absolutely no working out whatsoever, but I just started to like have a lot more hope. It was mostly my mindset that was changing. I was like, I I can recover from this. People recover from this. And to me, I think aside from the brain retraining, aside from meditating, aside from all of that, the literal biggest thing that continues to help me and helped me in the moment was just having hope, which sounds really stupid. I understand that I'm in the healthcare field. Like I'm very science-based, but Having this hope and having this belief in recovery is one of the things that helps calm the nervous system. And being in this constant state of hypervigilance, I believe, you know, you're in the constant state, you have the trigger, boom, the brain just flips itself and you got the chronic fatigue. So for me, having a positive mindset and believing in recovery is what I think ultimately pulled me out of it. And there's been months and months, obviously, this was like probably fall 20. 21. So I guess probably 10 months, the last 10 months, I've had ups and downs, but it truly feels like I'm always in an upward trajectory. When I reached out to you a couple months ago, I was like on my healthy high horse. I was like, I'm recovered. And then (laughs) since then, I've, you know, I've definitely had days where I mostly just would like to be in bed. I stand up and my heart rate's doing the thing and I do feel more fatigued. But the period of time that those last is very short. Like this literally happened to me yesterday, probably partially in anticipation of this interview, probably partially because my boyfriend's out of town and I don't like being home alone. You know, just like the stressors that 
kind of bring it back, but it lasted a day. Like today I'm fine. So that's not at all what it used to be like. It used to just be like, I couldn't get away from it. Mm -hmm. And I also have found myself being able to exercise, um, way more. I got up to six miles rollerblading before I got COVID this summer. And that kind of took me out again, but that's a big deal for me. Like being able to go any distance whatsoever, like walking, running, rollerblading, all of that is a really big deal. So that's incredible. And that's one of the things, I mean, you and I talked about this, you know, before we started recording, but it's an important topic to bring up this concept of full recovery because we all, of course, we all want full recovery. We want to believe in it. And, you know, we, we want to say that this is where we are, but it doesn't really re- exist. What does full recovery mean? Are we ever really fully there? And I think it's part of our, many of us seem to have this type A perfectionist type of attitude, hard driving thing. And I think when we go after this full recovery, it can add an element of stress to it all and a stress to the recovery process. Cause then every time you have a bad day or every time you need a nap, like you start stressing and like, mm-hmm. am I sick again? I'm supposed to be fully recovered. You know, I should be perfect. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it's a good topic to bring up. And I think a lot of us put a lot of stress on ourselves over this concept of full recovery. And yeah. um, it, it really, it seems like it's, it's the journey and learning tools to manage your health and keep yourself healthy and deal with these things. That's more important. And it's partially too, like, I feel like I know I could be better than I am if I did what I was supposed to be doing more (laughs) often. But when I feel decent, when I feel good, like, I just want to live my life. And no, I'm not going out and, like, doing significantly more exercise than I know I have, because that's a guaranteed, like, you're probably going to crash. But if it's, like, a busy weekend with friends and family, I'm like, I can take a little crash. Like I can handle it. And so I'll just, I don't know. It's just kind of an active decision for me, but I guess that's kind of why if I'm going to consider myself recovered, that's why I would is because where I'm at right now is sustainable for me. I can be happy. I can live a normal life. I can have kids someday while being this way. And like so many people have chronic migraine, have fibromyalgia, have, you know, real, you know, a non-chronic, non-syndrome things that they deal with, and they're able to live normal lives. And so Mm -hmm. I guess for me, yeah, I'm probably always going to be an anxious person. I probably am always going to, well, I hope I'm not always going to have chronic fatigue, but if I do, and it's like this, it's manageable. And like I said, just the mindset shift. I, I was not thinking that way at all. I was like, if I feel any of this at all, this is not like, that's not a life worth living. But it is like you can get better. And just because you haven't gotten better yet, clearly the stories on your channel, people have it. You even have it for so many years and then eventually found recovery. So I just want to like encourage that hopeful mindset. Definitely. And there are good things that come from it. I know that sounds crazy to say, but for me, like I said, I was working with that therapist when this like the eight months prior. And I remember telling her at the time, I was like, I can't relax. Like there would be days where it's a nice day out. It's Saturday. Um, you know, I I'd like to just sit in bed and watch like four hours of TV or something. You know, I have the house is clean. I know what I'm having for dinner. Everything's done. I, there's nothing to do. Um, I have no plans with anyone. I just want to sit down and like chill and I'd sit down and I instantly feel like I'm threatened. Like my body feels like it's, you know, people always talk about being on the Savannah with the saber tooth tiger or whatever. Like that's how my body would feel when I tried to relax so much of the time, especially if I was relaxing alone. And so I was like, I just want to be able to relax. And she didn't really, she didn't help me, but I think chronic fatigue, ultimately it came along and it was like, nope, you're going to relax. You don't have a choice anymore. And so truly through all of this, I have, I can sit there for six hours, eight hours on a Saturday and I can watch shows and I can play on my phone and I don't have this voice in my head the way it used to be. It's like, you're a pile, you're lazy, you're unproductive. I'm just kind of like, no, actually this is my life and I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm relaxing is good for me. And so I guess that's one of the really good things that came out of it is I truly have changed that voice in my head, you know, not all the time, but most of the time. So yeah. Uh, that is so relatable. You explained that so well. I, I definitely, yes, um, I could have been telling that story myself. I suspect a lot of people out there can relate to that. Yeah. Another reason I was excited to talk to you and have you on the channel is I know that you use the Curable app as well, right? As a part of your recovery. And I haven't really talked to many people who have used that. So what was your experience yeah. with that? Yeah. So 
Um, the Kier block came later in the story. Like I said, I started Gupta probably fall of 2021. This was spring of 2022 when I discovered the Kier app. Yeah, so I don't remember how I heard about it, but it might have been you. But anyways, I ended up downloading it. And it's honestly, if I'm going to recommend one place for people to start who like aren't feeling like they can spend a lot of money, I would definitely recommend Curable because it's super accessible. First of all, you can I'm pretty sure you can try it out fully without paying for it for a little while. And then if you want to continue with it, which it does take a while to like work your way through it. I don't know. I think it's like less than $100 for a whole year. So really not bad compared to a lot of the programs, but um, it's really nice too, because it is an app. A lot of the other ones you have to go log in online and you know, for a lot of us who are laying in bed and don't have a lot of energy, just simply like sitting upright and having a laptop on your lap can be too much. So this is like right on your phone. Um, basically, it's like a it's like chatting with a robot, if you will. Um, you go on and it kind of lets you select what you need in the moment. So do you want to meditate? Do you want to do a writing exercise? Do you want to like learn some brain retraining exercises or do you want to, what is it like hear like education about it? And it's all about chronic pain. So that's the thing is. I think a big reason that a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome don't use it is because it's not really geared towards us. But my whole philosophy is that whether it's fibromyalgia, whether it's chronic migraine, whether it's, you know, any of these issues, I do think that they follow similar like patterns. It's just really a matter of how your body wants to respond to the, to the stress, to the, you know, how, how is it wired, I guess. And so anytime that they were, you know, saying this is the, um, this is how pain works. Or when you're having pain, do this. I'm just like chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue. Like I'm responding as if they're talking about chronic fatigue. So yeah, it's, um, I guess for me, I, again, I was in this place where a lot of the time I was okay during this period, but whenever I would be in a low dip, I needed that inspiration. I needed that, like that encouragement of like what I can be doing to pull myself back out quicker and quicker each time. And so I watch your channel, I listen to podcasts and then I would use the curable app and yeah, it's just, I don't know. I think constantly feeding yourself good healing information is what helps with that mindset I was talking about. And I was on the Facebook forums. I was on Reddit and literally my biggest advice for anyone is get the heck out of there. Um, Watch Raylan's channel, <laughs> use these, go to people who are saying it's possible, listen to the recovery stories, because I, I just don't know how you recover when you're constantly being fed information that you're not going to. It's just not yeah. going to happen. I agree a hundred percent. I, you know, I started using another app recently called reframe and I bring it up just in case it might be helpful for someone who's watching, but <laughs> I'm so in love with this app that I, you know, I just want to kind of shout it from the rooftops, but it's actually meant for having a conscious approach to your alcohol consumption. Cause I find that, you know, alcohol is very ingrained into our life. So it's very easy to just start having it all over the place. And I'm one of those people that needs to have a conscious approach. Otherwise um, I will be having too much wine. Um, but the <laughs> app is incredible. And I, I would recommend it to people who don't even drink because what it really is, is just a daily program where it's teaching you tools to essentially deal with life, to calm your nervous system, to have mindfulness, to, um, you know, uh, meditation and um, understanding how you're body response to stress, you know, because a lot of what they're saying is basically many of us don't realize it in the moment, but we're actually turning to alcohol just to quickly change our state of mind or because we're not dealing with stress or anxiety or other things in our life. So yeah, I think in some of these apps really have a lot to offer. There's some really great stuff out there and they are way more affordable than a lot of the other, you know, kind of big programs. And I, I think yeah. some of them still have pretty, pretty big value that they're bringing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Erica. This has all been really helpful. Some really solid, um, great information. Are there any, you know, as we kind of wrap up, any you know final recommendations or, or things you think you left out that you'd, you'd like to share with people? So I think a big part of my story, like I, you know, had kind of shared is the gut health side of things. And for anyone who might be struggling with that particularly, I guess I will share. I don't feel like I'm on the other side of SIBO. I've stopped being retested. I was tested three times. Um, but I found that the less attention I paid to what I was eating and how I was feeling in that department, the better I felt kind of similar with chronic fatigue, like not catastrophizing it, not sitting there trying to solve it all the time. Um, and so I haven't tested. I don't know if I test positive these days, but one thing I can recommend to people if they are in that stage of it where 
you know, you have the, the rock in your stomach, things are not moving, things are not digesting. Um, two of the supplements that I feel like I can recommend, and of course, you can check with your doctor, um, but none of these are like crazy by any means. They're very natural supplements. One of them is betaine HCL, and it's basically just a stomach acid um, supplement. Like it's literally just HCL. So that's the acid in your stomach. And it seems kind of crazy because when people are having reflux, they want to kind of curb that acid. They want to decrease it. They're taking Tums. In my opinion, besides the comfort it gives, it's the worst thing you can do because you need stomach acid to digest your food. That's what it's for. Um, so when you decrease that, you're just slowing the process down even more. So by adding back more acid, you're actually helping food empty out of the stomach quicker. Um, so betaine HCL is one. And then another one is digestive bitters. You can get it in like a thing that you drop on your tongue. You can get, I used a spray. It's like a little spray digestive bitter thing. And that kind of prepares your body, kind of gets the digestive juices flowing as well. So if you do that a couple minutes before you eat, I do feel that both of those together and separate would help me when I was in those kind of worser phases of not digesting anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erica. I really, really appreciate I, I, you doing this. I know it's not an easy thing to do. So um, thanks for taking the time to share your story today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. And um, I guess I wish everyone who's still on their journey the best of luck in their recovery. Yes, absolutely. Keep going. Hang in there. Things can get better. Um, I, you've totally got this. And if you're watching and if you have a story to share, whether it's, you know, a recovery story or maybe, you know, you are a practitioner that, um, you know, has some information that you think that would be helpful and people would appreciate hearing, uh, let me know. There's a link in the video description. You can expand it and click on it and reach out to me and we can chat more. So yeah. Thank you again, Erica. Thank you to everyone who's watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found it helpful and I hope to see you in the next video.